Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I would like now to introduce uh, some Sonia Gomez Pereira from the Gulbenkian Institute of Science in Oeiras, uh, Portugal. Uh, I think uh, she will talk about centriol uh, assembly during sper spermatogenesis plants, combining different imaging techniques. So her talk is entitled uh, Asymmetry, Asymmetrical Maturation of the Novo Assembler Twin Centrioles. Thank you for sharing your work with us, Sonia, and, and, and you can start. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so as Maria said, my name is Sonia, and I'll be presenting you my PhD work and how we found out that the two centrioles in mosses can become asymmetric throughout spermatogenesis. Uh, okay. So centrioles are these um, microtubule-based uh, structures that compose the animal centrosome, where they uh, nucleate the spindle, and orchestrate the cytoskeleton. However, centrioles may also dock to the cell membrane and template cilia assembly. And cilia have many functions in our cells, namely airway cleaning, uh, but also sperm motility. Centrioles are known to duplicate. This is a process we know very well. Uh, indeed, centrioles duplicate once and only once per cell cycle. Uh, and this is known to happen uh, near the mother centriole where a new daughter is assembled. However, Centrioles have this very characteristic uh, complex ultrastructure, and it's quite puzzling how they can also form the novo without being templated from pre-existing centrioles. And this is what got me into this project. And if you look in, across nature, there are many ways that centrioles can assemble the novo. So for instance, in parthenogenic insects where there's no sperm contribution, centrioles arise as single centrioles during embryogenesis to allow for proper uh, embryo development. This happens, for instance, in parthenogenic wasps. In our uh, multiciliated airway cell, for instance, centrioles are amplified in these electron dense structures called deuterosomes. Other eukaryotes have completely lost centrioles, and this is the case for pollen plants that reproduce through means of a pollen grain with pollen tubes. Nevertheless, other land plants have kept centrioles only during spermatogenesis. And this is the case, for instance, of Ginkgo biloba that has a pollen grain, but inside two motile sperm cells are developed, and these sperm cells have thousands of cilia, which means that thousands of centrioles will be formed de novo in this structure called the blood chloroplast. I cannot work on, on trees, so obviously we had to go through an, a simple model first, and we decided to turn to mosses. So in earlier land plants, the sperm is biflagellated, so there's only two centrioles, and they are thought to assemble in this bicentriolar structure connected tail to tail. If you look at it, there are many questions that arise, namely, are these really different processes? I mean, they look different, but how different are they? Do they conserve uh, their structural components and their regulation, how you control the numbers of structures that you form, because for instance, in the single centrioles and in the bicentriole, you only need two centrioles. But if you look for the ultrasome or blepharoplast, you need hundreds to thousands of centrioles assembling, and how you control the sizes of the structures that you form. And as I told you, I decided to study this in these bicentrial uh, structures, which are very, very unknown. There was only two papers about it in the literature. So the model that I'm using is Cisco Mitrella patterns. This is a moss, and I won't go into details about the model, uh, but basically what you need to know is that most of the life cycle that takes around three months, it's haploid. And we can do genetic engineering through homologous recombination, which comes quite in handy because we can immediately knock in or knock out the target genes. Centrals only arise during spermatogenesis, which happen inside these organs called antheridia. So this is how it looks. This is an antheridium who just released his sperm content. They will stay still for around one minute, and then they will activate motility, as you see here, and some of the sperm cells will be able to move away until they reach the egg. So the first question we had was how are centrioles formed, and then how do they mature into basal bodies? And in here, that's where electron microscopy become really in handy, because, of course, the central has this characteristic ultrastructure that you can see through EM, and also, if you don't know anything about the molecules involved in the process, that's basically the technique you can use. So we decided to first characterize this in 2D, uh, and what you see here is that the first structure that we can identify is this bicentriole. So here you have one centriole, and here you have the other one, and they are connected through their cartule uh, in the middle. Later on, the two centrioles uh, that we call sister centrioles, or twin centrioles, uh, because they are formed in the same structure, um, they dock to this multilayer structure that you see here. This is a plant-specific structure uh, that has a spline of singlet microtubules, and below it has this electron dense material called the lamellar strip. This whole uh, structure then migrates towards the cell pole, 
where the two basal bodies uh, will nucleate, or centrioles, they will nucleate the assembly of the two cilia axonemes, which are nine plus two, as the same you see in motile cilia in animals. The lamellar strip will disappear and only the spline is left and the nucleus gets very condensed and elongated to allow for proper motility. However, during our analysis, we also saw this quite frequently. So here, the centrals are not fully ninefold symmetric, and this was puzzling. Furthermore, if you are familiar with uh, central ultrastructure, you easily recognize that this appears to be like cartwheels. And cartwheel is the inner part of the central that we know it's important for the proper symmetry and structure of the central. However, cartwheels are supposed to be inside the central in order to allow it to be stable and kept their symmetry. And here we see these long cartwheels, which are devoid of microtubules, and this is quite puzzling. And I'll go back to this later on during my talk. In parallel, we had this question of what are the molecules involved? Uh, and in order to do that, in the beginning of my PhD, we saw that there were indeed four proteins that are uh, conserved across all ciliated species. And for the sake of time, I'm only going to refer to two, which are SAS6, which is the main component of the cartule, so the inner part of the centriole, and POC1, which is known to be involved in centriole structure stability and elongation. And by looking into these proteins, and here I had to do the transgenic plan, so you see SAS6 uh, reported by M. cherry fusion and POC1 with citrine. What you see is that in early stage, and this we know because the nucleus is still round, there are two structures that contain both POC1 and SAS6. However, during development, where you already see cilia forming, so you have here one cilia and here's the second one, these are stained with acetylated alpha tubulin, you see that both SAS6 and POC1 signals elongate uh, a lot. And surprisingly, POC1 signal actually elongates differently in the two uh, structures. So we team up with uh, the quantitative data science facility at IDC, led by Tiago Paixão, and we could show that uh, most cells have one short and one long a POC1 signal, which we think are reporting the centrioles, meaning that the two centrioles can be of different sizes in the same cell. And this is quite striking because this is not known uh, in any other organism, and it's not known how it regulates, uh, how this process is regulated. Furthermore, during our semen analysis, we also saw this quite frequently. And here what you see is that indeed there are three structures containing SAS6. So here you have one with one cilia. Here you have the second one. And here you have a third one that does not nucleate uh, cilium. So we wonder what this third structure could be. Uh, and we team up with our local EM facility in order to employ CLAM. So CLAM stands for correlative light and electron microscopy. And the base of this technique is that in the same cells, you can have both light and electron microscopy done. And so in here you have the confocal image. So what we did is that we did histology sections of five micrometers and that we stand with DAPI because the nucleus have a specific structure that will be used to align the cell. So you go to your confocal microscope and you acquire your Z stack. You then in this histology section do EM and then you do the serial EM sectioning. And then you can superimpose your image and look for the cells that have a characteristic shape and the structure of interest, in this case, elongated SAS6 signal. And here, it also helps that we have different cells around so that we can easily track our cell in EM. You then choose your cell of interest. And with this analysis, what we could see is that indeed there are uh, two structures containing SAS6. So there is the, both the naked cartwheel here and also the multilayer structure, which is plant specific. This is very interesting and makes us wonder if uh, SAS6 could have particular functions in these cells and in this plant. Uh, and in order to, do, to analyze that, what we did is that we removed SAS6 from the genome. Uh, and if you do this, what you see now is that you lose all cartel structures, which means that the, the function is conserved. However, we don't see any alteration in the multilayer structure that I showed you before, which means that SAS6 is really only required for cartel assembly, uh, although it also localizes to the lamellar strip. Uh, also, if you look at now at POC1 localization, so if you do the knockout uh, in the background of POC1 citrine plants, you see that POC1 is now mislocalized, suggesting that SAS6 is upstream of POC1, and confirming that if you do the opposite, so if you remove POC1, SAS6 signal still elongates and looks fairly normal. So indeed, SAS6 is upstream of POC1, and they have both conserved their functions, because in the absence of POC1, what we see is that we don't have nine-fold symmetrical centrioles. Indeed, we only see that three microtubule triplets, in this case, you only see doublets, but there are triplets that can bind here, uh, and these are always the ones closer to the spline. So we think these microtubules may be kept stable because of their proximity to the spline. So there may be some mechanical coupling here. 
uh, and in agreement with these, uh, the axillings are also like halfway symmetric. So you see that there's symmetry in this side, but the other half of the cilia are missing. So this was very nice. Uh, but indeed, what was striking for us is that the two centrioles look very different. So you see that they have different lengths, but also Pokwan is not equally wide across the entire length of the centriole. So we decided to get ultrastructural detail in wild type cells and see if this was real. In order to do this, we decided to employ electron tomography. And if you are not familiar with this uh, technique, it's basically a technique where you just put your grid in the microscope and by tilting it, you need to take images at different angles. Basically, you get a series that you can reconstruct in 3D, much like in an LF uh, light microscope where you acquire different Z stacks and then you can reconstruct the full 3D image. So here, what you see in your left is the electron tomogram uh, of a mid-stage spermatid. So the two centrioles are separated. They are anchored to the multilayer structure that you can see here, the striation of the lamellar strip. So this is not an amorphous material, but they are not yet serving as basal bodies. So here you have the multilayer structure. Now you see one centriole. There is this blue electron density here that binds the centriole to the lamellar strip. And then you see the second centriole appearing. Both centrioles have cartules throughout their entire length, uh, which you can see in red. And the centriolar walls have different lengths in the different microtubules, which is known to occur if centrioles are still elongating. So here they look very similar. However, later on, when they are already templating cilia, what you see is that here we have the multilayer structure. Now, one cartule will appear here, okay? This cartule is naked cartule, so there is no microtubules yet. And in here, you see the second one. And the second cartule is already decorated by microtubules. Now, the central will become full nine-fold symmetry. Now, it's a transition zone, and it templates the assembly of the axonym. Only here, in the end of the video, uh, which has over three micrometers in depth, you see two central triplets being assembled from the first uh, cartule. So, this cartule is naked and very long, uh, and also only two triplets are seen, which means that maybe the other seven are shorter in their size. So this confirmed that indeed the two centrioles then mature symmetrically, both in terms of the cartilage length, which is quite different between the two structures, but also their centriolar wall, with one of them having longer microtubule triplets, and inside the same wall, the triplets are of different lengths. So with this, I would like to conclude by showing you that we have now characterized this new pathway for central biogenesis. And I haven't shown you, but we think there is indeed two bicentrioles being assembled and segregated uh, in the last mitosis to the spermatid. Then these centrioles break apart. They anchor to this multilayer structure and template the assembly of the two axonyms. At least part of the biogenesis pathway has been conserved to what we know from animals, with SASIC being required for cartilage assembly and being upstream of POCLAN which is at least partially required to get the full nine-fold symmetrical wall. Furthermore, the two centrioles assemble longitudinally, and this I, I didn't show you for the sake of time. So this is the tomogram we have of the bicentrial, where you can see in green the two central uh, walls, and they are connected in, in the middle by their cartule, which is a common cartule for the two centrioles. Uh, these then separate and become very similar. Uh, they start to elongate. And this elongation becomes very asymmetric throughout, throughout development with different microtubule lengths, but also cartule uh, lengths. And with this, I would like to conclude by thanking both my supervisors, Monica Pincourdias and Jörg Becker, everyone who helped me throughout my PhD, and particularly Anna Sosa, who was the M technician that was with me throughout all of this time. And thank you all for listening, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Sonia, for, for your impressive talk, uh, combining these, these two techniques that it's uh, really, really difficult and, and you have been discovering a lot of uh, cell biology. So, uh, well, waiting for, for questions, I have uh, one question. Uh, and wh why do you think that the, the centrioles uh, become asymmetric and, and during the, the development? And what 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 are your your impression on this? So we we think why, that why, yeah, yes yeah the why question right? Mm -hmm. So we think that this could be so that they would uh, anchor at different places in the cell, so that one would be more uh, towards a, a tip of the cell and the other uh, more like posterior in the cell body, and this mm -hmm. could uh, confer them different properties like in terms of beating their cilia, for instance. And in order to do that, we did, uh, well, I also didn't show you, we did some tracking of the cilia. 
And what we found out is that for most of the time, only one psyllium is beating, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't see a trend if it's always the same or not. Uh, so they can, both of them are motile, so both of them can beat, although most of the time only one is doing that. But we don't, we cannot see a trend if it's always the same. So I think it, it may be just a geometrical thing so that the cell can steer its movement. Uh, but it's just a wild guess, we, we cannot uh, tell. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I, I cannot see any, any more questions, sorry, because uh, we, we, are, we are adapting to, to this. But, uh, uh, well, I'm just a, a very general question and a curiosity from me. Uh, are, are there any differences between the, the, the plant cells and animal cells uh, in these structures, in centrioles? Uh, because, uh, well, the, the cells are quite different. And uh, have you, do you know that? There are, there are a couple of differences, but uh, so the main structures are conserved. So they are ninefold symmetric centrioles. They have the carter, which is the same. Uh, they are made of triplets anyway, but of course then from different organisms where you see that centrioles become a little bit different. Uh, so for instance, there is particularities with, for instance, the algae chlamydomonas, where their basal bodies keep uh, the cartwheels. And in human cells, the cartwheels are lost during mitosis because mm -hmm. they are used uh, in the cell cycle. Actually, what I see in my plant is that when they are beating their cilia, the cartels are also lost. Meaning mm -hmm. that there's something here that almost looks like human and different from what is known from algae. So there is then these particularities from organism to organism, which are quite interesting to see how they would be regulated. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know, uh, Julian, do you, are there any more questions? Sorry, because we are, so if there are not, more questions. Let's uh, let's proceed. And I think that now we will we will meet uh, in the in, in the speakers room. So we have yeah. to. And there is a break. And there is a break for like say uh, 20, 25 minutes. The people who want to meet Xavi can go to hop in in the meet the speaker session. Uh, otherwise, we will convene here at uh, eleven. I think. Okay. Thank you. So let's let's meet uh, now with with Xavier Trapato later. Thank you. Thank you Sonia for your talk. Thank you.